Oke, okay, let's get started. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, Alhamdulillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad. Oke, okay, good morning everyone. Uh, good morning our uh, fellow college, ERC lecturer, and also my beloved students. Good morning also our distinguished guests for, from University of Nottingham. Professor Ilyas, our uh, speaker today, and also we also have uh, Dr. Brian, Dr. William, Dr. Az. From we we already have wonderful discussion today, yeah, wonderful discussion today. And uh, before we get started uh, about our public lecture, digital pathology and the roles of artificial intelligence. In digital pathology, let me briefly introduce our speaker today, Professor Ilyas. He qualified in medicine in Bristol, uh, 1988. Uh, he awarded PhD in Oxford in 2000. Professor of pathology in Nottingham uh, since 2005. Deputy director Nottingham Molecular Pathology uh, Molecular Pathology Notes works in GI cancer, molecular diagnosis, uh, cancer uh, biology. Uh, I have seen uh, his publication, his track record is amazing. So we are very honored, very grateful, very lucky uh, today to have him as our uh, public uh, guest lecture uh, today. So make sure you pay attention, take notes, because maybe this could be our Uh, your future project for your final project maybe or for your research project and for our potential collaboration in the future so without further ado uh, please uh, join me welcoming professor muhammad ilyas uh, thank you very much uh, do, do i have a clicker for uh, for the slides Okay. Ah, okay. Oh, it's, it's not. Uh... Okay. It, it, it's great being in a computer department. The computer doesn't work, you know. So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so if I just try, I can probably do this. Oh, oh it's good. okay. Uh, brilliant, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, uh, th uh, thank you very much. So, uh, Dr. Chandra, uh, Dr. Uh, Julia, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, students from, uh, I think you're all computer scientists mainly, yes? Uh, okay, so um, um, first of all, uh, I I'm sorry that we, we had uh, such short notice before the, uh, before the announcement of this lecture. There's a number of things that kind of made things complicated, but uh, We're very, very grateful that uh, you know you were able to accommodate us and set up this lecture, and uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, we we can uh, talk about something which is going to be of uh, interest for you. Now, uh, and also I'd just like to mention, yeah, as Dr. Chandra mentioned, we've got Professor Kevin here, uh, Dr. Izzy, Dr. Uh, William, uh, also from Nottingham, as, as as a team to come out here and meet you and talk about uh, digital pathology. Now, uh, Dr. Chandra so, uh, mentioned uh, the, the, the area that I work in, and he talked about molecular diagnostics, gastrointestinal pathology, and the thing that he didn't say was artificial intelligence. That's because I don't work in artificial intelligence. So I, I'm just now going to pretend that I know a little bit about artificial intelligence, but uh, I know a lot about pathology, and you are the guys who know about uh, AI. So... Uh, I'm just going to talk about, you know, sort of kind of the uh, the uh, 
uh, potential overlap uh, between well i will talk about it if um, yeah <clears throat> about how artificial intelligence is becoming more and more important in uh, in uh, digital pathology and in diagnostic pathology <clears throat> so i'm going to cover um, uh, i'm going to cover what what I say about what, what what it is that we as pathologists do in terms of our routine uh, uh, routine work and how pathology is about extracting information extracting data uh, from tissues uh, sources of variation of the th kind of things that can affect the data that you're acquiring and this is with regards to uh, digital pathology and artificial intelligence uh, then i'll talk about the digital profile and uh, what that can be used for and this is where it's going to get depressing because i'm going to say artificial intelligence waste of time we don't need anything uh, all you need is human beings and so i'm going to certainly have to try to destroy artificial intelligence and then i'm going to finish with actually it's really important and then uh, this is how we're going to improve things uh, as we go forward uh, so if i can kick off with the the data pathway first so the, the, the there was a period of time uh, in the past when uh, the pathologist uh, his role uh, was to uh, look, uh, take some tissue look at the tissue and then make a diagnosis and uh, from the that I could send the information onto the clinicians, and then they would take the diagnosis, and then they would decide how to manage the patient. So they had a diagnosis. They say, "Okay, well, this diagnosis means this drug, or this diagnosis means that this is what we do next." And so, uh, in the early days, pathology was great. We'd uh, sort of come in into work at nine o'clock. By ten o'clock, we'd be finished, and we'd go home. You know? And uh, uh, then, uh, even histochemistry came along. And so immunohistochemistry is basically looking at proteins which are being in tissues. And so that then, then means we're doing extra tests. And so that then means that uh, we're, we're working a little bit harder. And so now we come in at uh, nine o'clock. By 10 o'clock, we finish the morphology. And by 11 o'clock, we finish the immunohistochemistry. The information has gone on to us. They're now managing the patients. So 11 o'clock, we go. OK, that was a great life. And then uh, we had uh, all these other things come along. Uh, so now we need to uh, also look at the molecular profiles, the mutations, the genes which are being expressed. Uh, there are new methods coming along all the time. Uh, we're now also looking at the digital profile. Uh, all of these things we need to get together to then pass on to the clinicians. But now you can see that whereas before we were going home at 10 o'clock, now we just don't go home. We're doing all of this stuff, uh, trying to extract data. And I, I, I'm joking, obviously, but uh, the, the, the important point that I'm trying to make here is that, you know, we, we start off with tissue. And initially, we were extracting just morphological data uh, to make the diagnosis. Then we were using protein data, immunistic chemistry. Now we're looking at molecular data, and we're looking at digital data and all of these are basically means of so kind of getting information from the tissue biopsy to help make a diagnosis to help uh, uh, plan the management and this is where you know the, the role of ai is uh, going to uh, become important and then you can also see that i've got here so pre-analytical uh, analytical and post-analytical and these uh, are really important. So pre-analytical means, you know, so the, the things that you do before you actually start, you know, so doing the analysis of the tissue. And so it's, it, it's, it's to do with how the tissue has been handled, uh, the kind of conditions it's been kept in, because all of these can affect what happens uh, to uh, to your tissue. And then uh, analytical uh, depends on the, uh, on the methodology you use. Uh, and the techniques that you use, and that can then also affect the way that you go into the post-analytical uh, phase, which is where you're actually trying to interpret the data. The, 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 the biggest problem uh, we're going to have uh, with digital pathology and AI uh, is going to be sources of variation. Oh, sorry. Um, so uh, what, what, what is it we're going to be using our digital profile for? Uh, so this is the sort of kind of problems that uh, we're going to be solving. So uh, we're going to potentially uh, be using AI to make some decision support. And I think this is the kind of the first area that uh, AI will have uh, some applications in 
uh, yeah, so we made the decision already, but then uh, the AI is going to help and support that decision. Uh, it may also help in uh, biomarker quantification. Um, it may help, so I'm just going to uh, uh, go forward. So uh, it's going to primarily, I think, help in decision support. Uh, biomarker quantification is now sort of kind of going into this area of uh, doing what I call pseudo molecular analysis. So this is extracting uh, information about mutations just from looking at the uh, the digital image, uh, and also sort of discovering new things, new classes of disease uh, from the digital profile. And then I think ultimately, uh, maybe not within the next five or ten years, but ultimately we will end up. Uh, where we use uh, digital profiling uh, for the primary diagnosis, and this will then kind of affect, uh, you know, so what happens in, in pathology. Okay, the biggest problem, the biggest problem AI is going to have uh, is the sources of variation. Now, I, mean, I, I know you're a computer scientist, so uh, the, the next few slides are going to be meaningless, but uh, I, I need to go through them anyway, just to show you that the data that you're dealing with, its origin has a huge impact on you know, so what the data are actually going to say and how you're going to uh, interpret the data. So remember, what we're doing is we're extracting data from tissue, right? So anything that happens to that tissue is going to affect uh, the data that you extract from it. So this is uh, the patient, and this is where, uh, let, let, let's use an example of a cancer, right? Uh, so this is uh, the cancer being uh, uh, taken out uh, of uh, the body, and this is an image uh, of uh, that uh, cancer here. So this is our primary data source. Yeah, and uh, we're going to be extracting uh, the data from this. It's just uh, basically an image. Uh, but from the first incision uh, that the surgeon makes, uh, from that point to getting to this point here where you have your image, uh, from incision to image, uh, there are many sources of variation, right? And the reason for that is because of the pathway that the tissue takes. Let's have a look at uh, the tissue pathway. So uh, before the uh, patient is even having uh, their surgery, so again, I'm going to use the example of somebody who's got a cancer and the cancer is being taken out and we're going to use AI in order to sort of, uh, make some, you know, kind of uh, extract some data from, uh, from that cancer. Uh, before uh, the patient has even had the first incision, they may have had some treatment. Uh, so they may have had some drugs. Drugs will then get into the tissue and then they will affect, uh, you know, sort of the molecules which are expressed in that tissue, which will then affect the image. Um, so before even starting, there may be some confounders. Uh, when the patient is uh, you know, sort of being operated on and is having their surgery, uh, there are these things which we call warm and cold ischemia. Now, warm ischemia is when the tumor is in the patient and the surgeon is taking the tumor out, right? Now, you can't just go in and then just take the tumor out. What you have to do is you have to clamp the blood vessels. So all the blood vessels are now sort of stamped, clamped, and there's no blood getting through to the tumor. Now, if there's no blood getting through to the tumor, the tumor has now got no oxygen. And if it's got no oxygen, then the cells may start dying. It becomes what we call hypoxic. And then you can see that that is going to alter the expression of molecules uh, within that tumor. Uh, so uh, before the tumor comes out, you may get this warm ischemia. Uh, once the tumor comes out, you may get this cold ischemia. Cold ischemia is the tumor is now out of the body, uh, but it's being, uh, it's being kept uh, waiting for a porter to come and take the tumor to the pathology department, to my department. And so that time can vary from, you know, so one patient to another. So this is what we would call a uh, cold ischemia. Okay, so we get it uh, into, into the pathology department. And then what we do is we take the tissue and we put it into a fixative. And that stops everything that's happening, right? So, so this is you know, a really important step. Uh, within the uh, within the sort of process of uh, uh, sort of the, uh, tissue analysis, that we put it into a fixative, and that stops the warm and cold ischemia from having an effect. 
spot, and that'd be great, except for the fact that uh, the type of fixative you use, uh, how much you use, uh, the amount of time that the, uh, the tissue is in the fixative, uh, the temperature at which the fixative is at, these can all affect the molecules because the fixative can cause you know, kind of molecules to interact with each other, cross-link, it can fragment molecules and uh, things. And so even this, uh, is a source of variation uh, which can affect the final outcome, right? Okay, so I hope you're getting depressed uh, because there's more depression to come, right? So, um, we've only got to the fixative point yet, and so uh, we, we, we're not going to. So, so this is you know a, a breast tumor. Uh, we're not going to examine this as it is. What we need to do now is chop this up into smaller bits and then take some tissue sections. Okay, uh, uh, you think that's going to be easy, right? Well, it might be easy, it might not be, because uh, what you then have uh, is a process whereby the tissue is put into these wax blocks. Uh, and then the wax blocks, uh, they make the tissue stiff. And then you can cut thin sections of the tissue, right? And uh, of course, that's straightforward, it's technical, except uh, the quality of the wax may affect the way that the, the, the tissue behaves. And then you can see here, you know, so there are, uh, the, there are thin sections. This is a very thin section of the tissue being cut here. But the, 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 the thickness of the section can vary from one day to another between one technician or another. And if you imagine we're going to be looking at images, the thickness of the section may be a, a crucial thing affecting the way that uh, uh, the tissue uh, is evaluated. And then uh, we take the uh, tissue section and then we, uh, we stain it. And so here we've got some staining and you think, well, okay, well, that's easy. You've got your section now on the slide, just put it into some stains and that's fine. But of course it's not uh, because uh, it, it, the, the stain becomes bleached. And so the stain on the Monday may be different to the stain on the Friday. And then if the, the, the section has different thicknesses, the amount of stain it takes up uh, may vary. And so here's another source of variation which may affect uh, the nature of uh, the image that you get. Okay, I hope you're suitably depressed uh, because that's not the end, right? And so now uh, we've got uh, uh, our, we've got, we've got our tissue section on glass and what we need to do is scan, uh, scan the tissue section uh, in order to create a digital image that we're going to run our AI algorithms on. So uh, we need to then so kind of acquire the data. Uh, and so you just put your glass slide into a scan, uh, into a scanner, but different scanners have different profiles. And so, you know, uh, scanner A may produce a particular profile, scanner B on the same tissue section may produce a different profile. So there's a source of variation there as well. The, the way the data is handled can also produce some variation. You can have lossless compression, you can have lossy compression, which results in some loss of data, depending on what algorithm you use can affect your data. And then eventually the, uh, the data you recover may then also be affected. So uh, data recovery may be uh, influenced. So you've got all of these sources of variation. The, the, the depression is now going to stop for a moment, right? Then I'm going to start again, right? So uh, what I've shown you is you know, so the, the, the possible sources of variation. And here are just some examples that are going to influence and really ruin your AI algorithms. And so we as humans see all of this, but the computers may not. So what, 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 what am I talking about here? So hopefully uh, you can see it. So let, let's start off down here. Uh, you can see that you know, so this is really nice and clear. You can see these sort of, kind of structures uh, down here. So this uh, is uh, all sort of, kind of nice and in focus. And you go up here and you can see that this is completely blurred, right? So this and this are the same, but they look different because this is out of focus. Now, what is really good about this picture is that uh, not only is this out of focus uh, compared to this here, but this is out of focus, or it's different focus compared to that. So in one image, 
we've got three different levels of focus. We've got proper focus, we've got slightly out of focus, and we've got really out of focus. Right? What's your computer going to do when it sees that? You know, but they go, ah, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. So, uh, so that's one of the things, you know, that, that may be a confounder. Okay, other things may be, uh, you know, so we cut the sections and then we use a stain uh, to stain the sections uh, to, uh, before we look at them. Uh, and then whilst you're cutting sections, if, uh, if your blade is old and blunt, then you might, might get these things here. So you can see this is uh, all artifact. This is not part of the tissue. It's because the instrument is poor quality. And so that's caused an artifact. Here is even brilliant. So this is about two millimeters, two millimeters. And within that space, you've got lovely staining here. And there's, there's a water blob, uh, which has got, got into the stain here, and it's pre prevented the, the staining going on here. Now, you know, so it, if you look at it, you think, okay, I mean, uh, for, for, for the non-pathologists, uh, you know, if I say to you, uh, are there any differences in this tissue? You say, well, yeah, okay, that is different from that. But for we as pathologists, what we know is that we can see that actually this is all one uh, piece of tissue showing exactly the same thing. But because of this, uh, you can see a lovely boundary here, you know, around the edge of the water droplet, probably, uh, that uh, the, the, the staining uptake is different here compared to that. And that is just an artifact. That tissue shows one diagnosis only, but the color scheme uh, makes it look like there are two different things uh, going on here. Okay, uh, so that's a little bit more depression. Uh, here we've got... Um, uh, some more, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be killing yourselves by the end of this. You'll never want to work with digital pathology again when we get to the end of this. So, uh, so another source of variation may be, you know, this is, um, this is immunohistochemistry. We're, we're using uh, antibodies to identify proteins. And, you know, I said the, the, the fixation can affect the way that the tissue behaves, right? So here we've got, uh, we've got two samples from the same patient, right? Two samples from the same patient, two different samples from the same patient. Uh, one has been well fixed and the other one has been badly fixed. And uh, it's the same antibody we're using. We're looking for the same protein. And so here you can see that uh, you've got uh, all the nice brown dots showing that it's positive, right? And here you've got no brown dots showing that it's negative but it's not negative, it's actually positive, but it looks negative because uh, it's been poorly fixed. And so again, uh, fixation can affect the intensity of the immunostaining, right? So immunostaining may be one of the biomarkers we're using to uh, uh, quantify or we, we're using to evaluate the tissue. And so the biomarker itself can be confounded by what's happened upstream uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, so the, 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 the processing of the tissue. Okay, uh, let's carry on. So uh, here we've got uh, another potential confounder. So, uh, you know, the, the, the previous image I showed you was of what looked like two different diagnoses uh, in one image, but I'm telling you that that was a staining artifact. Here, uh, we've got tumor heterogeneity, and here we've actually got two different diagnoses in one tissue. And so here we've got uh, a tissue uh, and you can see that uh, it's nice and brown. And this is what we call proficient mismatch repair, PMMR, right? Uh, uh, you can see it's sort of nicely staining here. But on this side, uh, we've got uh, the staining which is missing. And so this is deficient MMR, uh, mismatch repair. And so we've got one tumor, part of which is PMMR, uh, the other part of which is DMMR. Now, again, uh, because we sort of can know about this, uh, and we know that you know, this can happen sometimes, we can sort of, kind of uh, uh, you know, so we, we can anticipate what's going to happen and we can report it appropriately. But it's just to sort of kind of emphasize that there is heterogeneity within a tissue. You know, so if we're again looking at a tumor sample, it may not be exactly the same all the way through. And so some of that heterogeneity may affect your diagnosis. Uh, other bits that heterogeneity may not affect the diagnosis. So again, it's just something that we uh, need to be aware of. Another interesting thing is here, we've got this line here, 
uh, this is uh, just a folding artifact where the wax uh, tissue is just folded over a little bit because the yeah because it's it's just one of the technical things uh, that can happen. And so unless you can get your algorithm to exclude this, remove these uh, data here, and also here, remove that, then if this goes into your analysis, uh, then it's going to maybe sort of kind of confound uh, that, uh, that analysis. Okay, here's uh, just another example, depression continues. So this is um, uh, uh, a program that we developed uh, with, um, uh, with a postdoc uh, in Birmingham, Mohammed Abdul Samir. And so I asked him to sort of write an algorithm which can separate uh, two different parts within a tumor. Uh, so uh, epithelium and stroma. And so he wrote an algorithm which identifies the epithelium and you can see here uh, the blue. And you think, okay, well, that's great. That's absolutely fantastic. And in between, you've got the stroma and that's negative. And so this is looking good. Uh, we're going down here, it's looking good, it's looking good, it's looking good. And then we get down to here and something strange has gone on because this is blue and this bit is not blue. And you're thinking, well, why is that? Because this is all one gland. Uh, this is obviously a tumor epithelium, but it's obvious if you're, uh, if you're a pathologist, you know, th this is obviously tumor epithelium. And why is it that the algorithm is picked up the epithelium here, but in the other half of the gland, it's not picked it up. It's picked it up here, it's picked it up here, it's picked it up here, picked it up here, but this area here has just not been picked up. And why is that? And, and the, the answer is we don't know. But, you know, we're just assuming that there is, again, so some variation in fixation, which is affecting the so kind of the, the, the quality of the image, which is then so kind of confounding uh, the, the algorithm. So, again, uh, variation, variation, variation is uh, going to uh, uh, affect uh, what you uh, what you see. OK, uh, uh, we talked about, you know, just the uh, so some of the sort of natural variation we see. Uh, this is uh, about how to the human eye anyway, the context can alter uh, what you see. So. Uh, sorry, it's. No, so I'm, I'm going to skip this one because it's not worked as well as, as it should be doing. It, it was meant to kind of show that uh, uh, depend, uh, depending on the background, uh, the same thing can look different. So this one should be looking slightly brighter than that one, but we're just not getting the effect. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so, that, that, so, so that's the end of the depression bit, right? So uh, what, what I've told you is that, you know, there are many sources of variation. Uh, and that's going to be the uh, the biggest uh, confounder for uh, for the AI algorithms. Uh, you can reduce uh, uh, you can you can reduce um, uh, some some of the variation by standardising protocols. In the UK, every single hospital has slightly different protocols, and the way that things work are slightly different. You know, and then if you can also start factoring in things like you know, uh, for example, if an operation is done at the weekend. Uh, is there a way of ensuring that it's handled in the same way as if uh, you know, an operation was done during the week? Because the AI algorithms, you know, so will not easily cope with uh, with this variation. So you can reduce it by standardizing protocols. Uh, you can reduce it by ensuring image quality uh, by using algorithms to check for focus, uh, and then you can also you know sort of deal with variations in staining. Uh, by a variety of pre-processing steps to kind of normalize the staining and make sure everything is uh, fairly similar. Uh, but uh, it, there's nothing you can do about the intrinsic heterogeneity. You know, there, there will be heterogeneity within tissues and that will uh, always uh, be a confounder. Okay, so we, 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 we're now aware of the, uh, of the sources of variation. Let's say that, okay, we, 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 now we're aware of them, then we can sort of, kind of write in, uh, you know, sort of uh, algorithms to sort of, kind of deal with that sort of, kind of variation. And so let's just start looking at, you know, so what we're going to do uh, with, uh, uh, with the digital profile. So we've got our tissue, we've now scanned it in, now we're going to do the analysis. So this is the uh, analytical phase. Now, like I said, uh, you know, you, you, you guys are the people who know about AI, so you can probably tell me more about this than I'm going to tell you. 
Um, one of the problems that we have is that uh, when we scan in the images, uh, the images, uh, according to the topology, are around five gigabytes in size. So one image is five gigabytes in size. And let's say uh, you have you know, so a resection specimen of a colorectal cancer. Uh, you may have uh, 20 slides. So you're now dealing with uh, 20 times five gigs. Uh, so you're dealing with 100 gigs for one case. Right? And we have 60,000 cases coming through our department uh, in, uh, in Nottingham. So uh, the, the images are quite large. Uh, they're usually 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. So you've got 10 billion pixels uh, to be dealing with. Uh, each pixel is uh, 0.25 uh, microns in size. So th this is kind of uh, high resolution. Sorry, that, that's uh, from the, the previous slide there. Okay, uh, the images can be interrogated uh, in a, a variety of different ways. So you can interrogate the images uh, at the pixel level. Uh, you can inter interrogate them at the object level, and then you can also uh, look at them at a kind of slightly higher uh, semantic level where you're looking at a, a more complex data in order to uh, do, uh, do your analysis. Um, and then you do your analyses in order to kind of extract features uh, on which you make some sort of kind of uh, inference uh, based on uh, what these uh, features contain. Um, here's just a, 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 an example of, I mean, uh, um, um, I use this just, again, just to sort of kind of tease people really. So uh, we've got, uh, uh, we've got two different images here. So I, th I think even as uh, you know, kind of non-pathologists, you'll be able to see that this uh, has got you know so kind of one uh, appearance with all these long uh, tubular things here, whereas this has got a slightly different appearance with all these sort of kind of circular things which are all slightly odd shapes. Uh, this is slightly pink. This is slightly more blue. Uh, but if you were to look at these images in Photoshop and look at their just this is their uh, RGB profiles, uh, their color profiles, and you can see that you know so this looks like a slug. Uh, this also looks like a slug as well. And so you have two completely different uh, diagnoses. These are two completely different uh, things. That's an adenoma. Uh, this is normal mucosa. And yet the pixel profile will have a similar distribution. Anyway, uh, you can uh, examine things uh, at the pixel level, but uh, we've um, talked about you know, uh, billions of pixels that uh, you're trying to deal with. Uh, and so a, a trick that uh, can be done is you can sort of merge the uh, pixels together into tiles. Uh, and so this allows the images to become a bit more manageable. Uh, you can then interrogate uh, the pixels for a number of features. Uh, you can look at color, texture, uh, and a variety of sort of different things. Now, again, with the, with the AI algorithms, uh, the artificial intelligence can look at millions and millions of features. You know, and this is, again, one of the kind of possible problems uh, that may come uh, with, the, with, with the clinical application of, uh, uh, of uh, these algorithms. Uh, you can then sort of, kind of take uh, pixels which have common features and group them together to create objects. And so now you're looking at uh, uh, object level analysis. Uh, and then you can uh, put the objects together. So, you know, uh, uh, this would be cells, for example, you put them together then to kind of create these. Uh, uh, slightly more uh, organic structures uh, or, or to create these uh, uh, higher order structures. So we, we're looking at pixels uh, for a number of uh, different features. Uh, we can put the pixels together and create objects which will have features of their own. We can put the objects together to create uh, other structures which uh, have features of their own as well. And this is the kind of thing I mean. So, uh, you know, so here again, uh, you know, I'll show you uh, as, as a pathologist. Uh, so this is a, a picture of a normal colon. And uh, what I've done is uh, I've uh, uh, then sort of kind of grouped uh, all of these uh, things together. So the, the, the kind of primitive objects will be the cells uh, which are forming here. And these are all arrayed uh, in, in, uh, in a row here, going around up here as well, and so sort of forming uh, what we would call uh, this gland. And so that would be this kind of high level, uh, uh, level structure that uh, we're looking at. The other thing I want to point out is, oh, actually, I'll point that out in a minute. Okay, so uh, each image uh, contains a number of different uh, uh, tissue uh, or cell types. And so whether you're 
uh, interrogating at the pixel level, the object level, or uh, at the, uh, at the sort of higher semantic level, uh, if you know the different uh, tissue or cell types, then you need to separate them or segment them so you can sort of do your uh, analysis appropriately. Uh, so your region of interest uh, needs to be uh, identified and separated out because you may not be interested in absolutely everything uh, that's there. And so uh, the segmentation uh, can be done in an automated way <laughs> or uh, if you've got uh, a pathologist who's got nothing else to do, uh, you can get them to sort of manually annotate uh, uh, your uh, tissues. So just going back to this one here. So uh, I showed you this a, a minute ago. So this is uh, a normal colon. And uh, what I'm going to show you is that, you know, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to mask out the glands because we're really interested in the stroma. Uh, the stroma is this bit here in between uh, these tubular structures. So what we need to do is we need to segment out the stroma or put a mask on the glands. So uh, I showed you this before. This is uh, the gland. Let's remove it. Oh, um, I'm sorry. That was meant to go white as well, but uh, but you can see what I'm doing here. So I've uh, taken uh, the other glands, and what we're doing is uh, we're removing them. And so eventually, all that's left is the stroma in between. So we've segmented out the stroma, so we can do the analysis of the stroma by itself. And so the analysis isn't confounded uh, by these areas here. So as part of our analysis, then we sort of kind of uh, segment it out our region of interest uh, that uh, we're looking at. Uh, once you've identified your region of interest, uh, then your uh, analysis proper can begin. Uh, and then the analysis can be done in a supervised uh, way, or uh, it can be unsupervised, or uh, it can be done by uh, what's called weekly supervised. Now, again, you, you, you guys will know a lot more about uh, this uh, uh, than I do, but you know, so in order to, uh, uh, to, uh, to do analysis in a supervised way, uh, you need to, uh, well, it's more controlled analysis, um, but you need to uh, get some annotations of uh, your uh, of your images. So you're looking to kind of discriminate features between, let, let's say, two different diagnostic categories, uh, and you need the image to be precisely annotated. Uh, this would be uh, the best way of doing it because it means that uh, you need less data. Uh, but the problem is, it's a very laborious process, and uh, it means that you know, you you need uh, a lot of pathology time. And you need some some pathologists who are not going to get uh, really upset uh, with you asking uh, uh, to do this uh, because it really is uh, time consuming. Okay, well let's say we 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 don't want to do this because we can't find a pathologist. Uh, we can then sort of go to I'm not going to talk about unsupervised where you just kind of throw it in so you 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 away for uh, class distinction. Uh, but let's say we, we're going to do weekly supervised analysis. And here, all we would do is we would take you know we would take a series of slides from diagnosis A, and we take a series of sides from diagnosis B. We're not gonna say anything other than the, 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 the label diagnosis, and that's going to be the only supervision we give. Uh, so this can be done on the basis of slide label only. It doesn't need any more uh, annotation, um, but uh, the images don't need to be annotated. We'll let the algorithms extract the features that they want. Uh, but the problem is it requires a huge amount of data. And you know, as I've already shown you, you know, that there are so many sources of variation already, uh, and those all need to be sort of taken account of. And you need, you know, so kind of in both categories, uh, you need all the variations that you can see. So uh, the, the um, uh, different uh, features can be, uh, or this discriminating features can be identified robustly uh, and uh, consistently. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, now this is uh, most definitely your area. So we've now got our uh, so kind of uh, pixelated images. Uh, we've decided we're going to then so kind of do slide label uh, uh, weekly supervised analysis only. And uh, you know th there are now uh, the, the, there are a whole heap of publications uh, which are working on the uh, evaluation of uh, histological images. And here you can see, so in this particular uh, uh, in this particular uh, image, so I've taken this from from a publication, 
uh, where they're using the image analysis to try to extract molecular features. So they're doing the image analysis to identify mutations. So what they've done uh, is they've, uh, they've then sort of kind of labeled tumors in accordance with uh, presence or absence of mutations. And they've used that as the sort of kind of only label between the two different categories. And so you've got, um, uh, yeah, it, it, so this is working on glioma and they're looking at, uh, you know, it's kind of 1P uh, deletion versus uh, uh, other deletions. So, so the labeling is do done based on their mutation profile. Uh, the images go in, and this, uh, this bit you'll realize or you'll understand, you know, is something I don't understand. All, all, all I know is back propagation and then forward propagation, and then you, you end up with uh, a, a diagnosis of some sort. And so, you know, so they, they identify features uh, uh, patches and then so eventually they make uh, their, their, their whole diagnosis. Uh, but the important thing is, you know, so th th this is an algorithm uh, which is run by your uh, uh, AI program. And then this is the kind of results that you get. So they, uh, like I say, you know, they, they, this kind of publication is becoming increasingly more common where uh, they're taking the images and they're getting really sophisticated amounts of data here. So uh, in this publication, I think this is from about 2018, so you know, it's like four years ago, uh, they were doing this, and they're using uh, mutation prediction uh, of uh, non-small cell lung cancer uh, using uh, deep learning uh, based on histological images, and so here you've got uh, this here. And of course, it's important to identify the mutations because the mutations will then dictate what kind of therapy uh, these, uh, these tumors get. Uh, here's another example. So this is deep learning uh, or AI to predict microsatellite instability directly from histology in gastrointestinal cancer. Uh, so this is, I think, in 2020 or maybe 2021. Uh, and you, you can see that they've done the same here. We've got our kind of standard back propagation neural network thing here, which goes into all images. And so uh, then with this kind of particular program, uh, you know, so just based on the histological images, uh, and the, the, this is about, without doing specific molecular testing, just based on the histological images, uh, they think they can get you know, an area under the curve uh, to discriminate uh, microsatellite instability from non-microsatellite instability, an, an AUC of about 0.9, uh, they reckon. Now, again, th this is another question that uh, we need to think about, you know, uh, that uh, if your, uh, you know, your, your uh, discrimination is only 90%, is that going to be good enough uh, for you to make a decision on uh, giving chemotherapy or not? Because, you know, so in terms of research, uh, you know, so 90% uh, identification is absolutely brilliant. But if you're a patient and, uh, you know, so your uh, clinician comes to you and says, right, uh, I want to give a. Th uh, I want you. I want to give this chemotherapy. It's going to cost a lot. It may be toxic, and I'm only ninety percent certain that I've got the diagnosis right. You know, I mean, well, uh, but it's just something for us to maybe ponder on uh, later on. Number of publications that are using machine learning and deep learning uh, uh, decision decision support are increasing, and you know, again. You know, I, I've been so kind of in the game long enough to see trends come and go. And what you do know is when something is very, very popular, everything gets published. You know? So whether it's good or bad, it will just get published because it's caused, it's captured the imagination. It doesn't matter about the quality of it almost. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're in that sort of kind of period of hype uh, where everybody thinks that, you know, it's a kind of AI in, uh, in digital pathology is going to conquer everything. And we, we don't need to do uh, molecular testing anymore. We don't need the pathologists anymore. You know, all we need is, uh, uh, is an algorithm. So, you know, it, it's very popular. Uh, but one of the uh, one problems is that, you know, is that these many black box applications, like say, uh, the algorithms can examine, you know, kind of thousands or hundreds of thousands of features. And so you don't know exactly you know so kind of what it's what it's using to uh, make its uh, uh, diagnosis um, there is kind of issues around uh, generalizability and transfer learning so you know an algorithm which works <coughs> sorry which works on one sort of kind of diagnostic category uh, with images captured from one particular type of scanner will not necessarily work 
on the same diagnostic category on images captured from different scanners. So, you know, it could be the same, uh, same tissues, but a different scanner will then just kind of uh, uh, upend the, uh, the algorithm. And so there are issues about, uh, like I said, the general generalizability, the transfer learning. Again, uh, you'll know more than me, you know, it's whether you can use uh, the algorithms for identifying malignancy in one tissue type, whether the same ones apply in different tissue type. With human beings, you know, uh, as we learn our pathology, the, there is this transfer learning because you get to so kind of get a, a, an understanding of what you know, so uh, malignant cells look like. And so when you see malignant cells in one context, the, the features that they have in a different context are usually similar. And so, you know, as, as human beings, there's a lot of transfer learning. What we learn in one tissue is applied to another tissue, but it doesn't work quite as well uh, with, uh, with, the, uh, with, with, the, with the algorithms. And then there are, there are these issues around interpretation. Like say, if you've only got 90% for, 90 confidence that you've got the diagnosis right, is that enough uh, for somebody to, to make a management decision? The other thing is that, you know, um, the, uh, the trained algorithms, uh, you know, so with 90% accuracy can identify mutations, uh, but, uh, but, you know, so treatment of uh, patients is moving beyond that. So uh, here we've got uh, a, a paper talking about the targeting of this mutation here. So this is KRAS12, uh, uh, G12C. Now, KRAS is a gene which has lots and lots of mutations, right? It's, it's mutated in a lot of cancers. Uh, and, uh, you know, so the, the, the algorithms can uh, pick up KRAS muta mutations uh, and uh, tumors without KRAS mutations. They, they can discriminate those. But what they can't yet do is they can't yet discriminate KRAS G12C mutations from KRAS G12D mutations, right? And that makes a difference because if it's KRAS G12D, it's got KRAS mutation, but you can't use this drug. If it's got KRAS G12C, you can use this drug. And so you need that sort of kind of difference. Uh, you need to be able to discriminate between the two in order to make your uh, clinical decision. And so, you know, you probably could uh, train an algorithm to discriminate between the two, but then you just need huge numbers of tumors with the uh, G12C mutations and huge numbers with the other mutations as well to identify uh, these uh, mutations specifically. So the, there's a problem with, uh, you know, so kind of get the, the, the granularity of the information that you may be getting. Uh, another problem is that, uh, you know, um, uh, you can, uh, the, the algorithms can only identify features that they've been trained on. But in terms of cancer, uh, we're now developing cancer vaccines and we're developing cancer vaccines for mutations which are in the tumor. So these are mutations that we may not know about, but if you use gene sequencing technologies, you'll identify the mutations, but uh, with, the, uh, with the algorithms, they will only identify what they've been trained on. So, you know, they won't provide uh, the same kind of answers as uh, you know the, the actual gene sequencing data would. Okay, uh, the algorithms are kind of written for uh, certain tasks. So the, like I said, the, there's issues uh, around generalizability. So it may be that you know they, they're, they're only applicable for certain tasks. Uh, each one requires a lot of validation, and so for each individual thing, uh, you may need an individual algorithm. We will then sort of need validation. So there's a lot of work uh, uh, to be there, uh, to be done there. And then what happens when, uh, for example, you update an algorithm? So, you know, you've got your algorithm for grading breast cancer. Uh, you come along and then you sort of, kind of change the algorithm a little bit to sort of improve its performance. Uh, well, currently, if you change the algorithm, Again, now, you know, so once we have large banks of images, oops, so once we have large banks of images, it won't really be a problem because you can then just run your algorithm on the same sets of images and confirm their uh, validity. But you know, again, it's just something uh, that uh, will be a problem. Uh, and then, you know, so again, uh, how many tasks will, will, will each algorithm take? So, you know, so if you're uh, counting, uh, let's say, mitotic figures in correctal tumors, 
do you, can you use the same transfer it for can, cancer mitotic figures in breast cancers or do you need something uh, uh, completely different so it may be that every individual task that you do which as humans we do so in an automated way altogether but for every single task you know so using computer algorithms you then may need one algorithm for every small thing which then just uh, uh, makes it uh, more complicated all right, that's the end of the depressing bit. Let me let, let me just yeah, let me just be a bit more optimistic, right? So, so we we can be, be slightly happier after this. So, so first of all, uh, you know, so as um, uh, as kind of artificial intelligence and deep learning becomes more popular, uh, you know, we, we're getting a lot more uh, so kind of uh, uh, availability of uh, softwares that we can use. And I mean, you're, you're a computer scientist, right? And what you need is you need a pathologist who understand, who have a, a, a literacy in uh, digital pathology. And so we've got so algorithms like this, uh, which are uh, uh, designed for uh, pathologists really. So uh, democratizing deep learning for microscopy using zero cost uh, deep learning for microscopy. So this is you know, so meant to be something uh, you know, so for pathologists for us to get more educated so we can then kind of communicate with you and we can so come together on uh, some problems. So uh, that's a great thing. Um, there are other things that we can use. So I'll just show you how much time have I got? Uh, I'm going to show you anyway, because th th this will make you happier. So uh, we, we, we so kind of also sort of developed uh, another way of so hopefully annotating things a bit more precisely. So um, we developed this uh, thing which we call histogenic molecular mapping. So um, each sections are four microns thick, uh, microns thick, and this is less than the, the the depth of one cell. And so, what we thought was that uh, if you sort of theoretically section, uh, question, uh, sec uh, if you cut sections very close together, uh, if they're only four microns apart, then uh, they'll be very closely aligned. But what you do need is really good image registration algorithms to put them together. But if you could do that, then you can make a composite map of uh, biomarkers. And so what I mean by that is that, uh, you know, you, uh, you can see that you know, so th this cell here is uh, 30 microns in depth. So if you're just kind of cutting this into four micron sections, then, uh, you know, th they should be fairly, uh, fairly close together. Uh, and uh, you can't see this at all, but uh, what this is showing is a number of images uh, all stained with different antibodies. So it's from the same tumor. Uh, so this looks, so this is what I call a piranha. You can see the mouth here, uh, you, but that mouth is over there and that mouth is down there. So the images are rotated, rotated and flipped. They're all stained with different antibodies, but if you have the right registration algorithms, you can unflip them rotate them around and put them on top of each other. Uh, so you can do this. And so this is the different antibodies all stained uh, uh, together and put, put onto one map. And so what you can see here is that kind of this part of the tumor here uh, has uh, you know, th this profile where um, uh, MLH1, PMS2 are expressed, but MSH2 and MSH6 aren't. Uh, this part of the tumor here, which is basically normal, is expressing all four of these proteins by so by doing this histo histogenic molecular mapping, uh, you can identify regions of interest, and then by doing it more pre precisely, you can do what we call this faux multiplex immunological chemistry, uh, which allows price registration and alignment of images, and therefore a slightly more uh, precise annotation to uh, uh, and use this for annotating images. Uh, what we've got here is, uh, uh, so uh, this is uh, a tissue section stained with uh, three different things, so CD3, CD20, uh, Bury P4. Uh, this is their individual uh, stains with, uh, uh, with false colors. Uh, put them all together and we get, you know, it's a kind of really so kind of a precise uh, mapping of the different types of cells. So this is all tumor cells. These, these are immune cells. And so the red areas are uh, one type of immune cell, green areas are different types of immune cells. And so you could use uh, this method for uh, uh, precise annotation. And so if we just go a little bit closer, you can see that uh, uh, this is the And uh, you can see the, the, uh, these are mainly uh, T cells. Mm. Uh, these are mainly B cells, and where the yellows are is where the T cells and the B cells uh, are uh, mixed together. 
Okay, uh, so um, image quality. So, so in terms of digital quality and AI, uh, image quality is uh, going to be a big, uh, a, a big compound. And like I say, we have all these sources of variation which are going to affect uh, the quality of your image and uh, your analysis. Um, it's com uh, compounded by uh, natural variation, uh, i.e. natural heterogeneity. Uh, but the good news is, you know, uh, huge amounts of data uh, which will become available and which are becoming available uh, and we can use these different tricks to uh, produce some uh, nice annotation and then on top of that uh, you know so you can train your algorithms on anything and so we can then uh, train the algorithms uh, on outcomes uh, such as response to therapy on uh, things like prognosis and so we're never going to use AI just by itself. It will always be used in combination with the genetic markers, with the histology, with all the clinical information, all of that together in combination then will you know, kind of help uh, improve the amount of information we have on patients and improve their outcome. Okay, so hopefully um, you're not too depressed. Uh, I've told you about what pathologists do. We extract data from tissues. Um, as far as the AI is concerned, uh, the biggest problem is going to be sources of variation in the way that uh, the tissue is handled and the images are acquired. Uh, there are a number of different ways that are generated uh, pixel level, object level, pixel level, um, but where uh, the sources of variation uh, can be adjusted. And then uh, optimistically, there's a lot of things that we can do as we go. So it's, it's, it's a brilliant technique and it's going to make a lot of difference. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Muhammad Ilyas, for giving us the comprehensive overview of digital pathology pathway. Um, I believe for us, uh, computer scientists, artificial intelligence uh, enthusiasts, the beauty of working together with domain expert, especially digital pathology uh, pathologists, is we can we can formulate interesting problems. Yeah. Right. We can validate our method, our results, and also we can make impactful, applicable, and useful solution. Because we don't want to make solution that nobody care. Yeah. <laughs> It's very good. It's applicable. Uh, it's uh, have a good because yeah. it, nobody will use it. Yeah. That's that's. Uh, I think we can collaborate. Uh, the the value of uh, our future collaboration, and I can see also that uh, there will be some challenges, especially in big data. The uh, the huge size. Mm. You mentioned that one slide can be five gigs. Mm. Okay, and we need. We 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 we, we, we want to give you a challenge, you know, so we yeah. don't make it too easy. <laughs> yeah, we need to uh, to find a way to make it possible, to make it efficient, to make it doable. Uh, also see that we have some issues, especially because state of the art AI is basically based on deep learning, which is black box computation. So it, it's yeah. ability, How we make sure that it can do. Uh, good okay you can produce result but how okay yeah. yeah so i think yeah that's very interesting discussion and uh direction for future collaboration i will give uh opportunity for uh participants maybe two participants can give questions either offline or online how many people we have okay okay if uh, anyone have questions please why, 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 why are they thinking? I mean, can, can I ask you a question? So yes. let, let, let's go back to the black box. Yeah. You know? I mean, do you think we're to, you know, kind of uh, produce an algorithm which is, you know, so let, let's say discriminating cancer A from cancer B? Is there any way that we can extract the features which uh, then help that discrimination or, or black box? Uh, there is direct in AI community, it's called explainable. Yeah, explainable artificial intelligence. Yeah. There are some some ways, especially for example, if uh, we are working with images data, yeah. because it's come from the input layer and many and every hidden layers learning such, for example, low level features, medium level feature, high, high level features, and we can extract these features. Right. Yeah, we can visualize this feature 
for example they learn the line they learn the diagonal they learn the circle and their combination of these low level features right. so i think there's also direction in ai community to learn about explainable ai yeah what what, what do you think about sort kind of the algorithms being updated then so you know so let, let's say kind of it goes into a black box and yeah. then you get you, you you get a diagnosis and then oh let, uh, let, let's say you you buy a new scanner and then you you kind of you uh, adjust your algorithm for stain normalizations and all to that so what would you do then with the algorithm updates is that a problem i mean can algorithm updates totally destroy the algorithm or, or... And if we already train the model right yeah. and we train the 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 parameter of the model yeah yeah there are uh two ways i believe first we just use this newly available data to retrain the model right okay just just use so it's called you you mentioned previously like pre-train model yeah or transfer learning right learning uh pre-train model so we leave the existing weights or parameter as it is the newly available data set train the model right. or another way is just we uh we use all the data one and new one and we train from scratch okay running from the beginning okay which do you think is better just going from scratch uh, or, uh, <laughs> using transfer learning uh i think the first one yeah. okay the first one but i don't know uh until we get the result from experiment then we can right. be sure 100 percent sure which one is okay. better okay. Right. Yeah. okay okay does anyone have questions uh, you can also ask Dr. Chandra questions. I, I, I'm asking him questions. So. Yeah. The question should be directed to Professor Ilyas. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> no, the, 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 this way is easier for me. You know? <laughs> okay, please. Yes, William. So, yeah, it's a question for both of you. Uh, so, uh, Latch, you mentioned. Uh, about with MMR um, mm. testing as an example, that you know this problem of you've only got ninety percent certainty yeah. in, in in a decision, but presumably with algorithms they could with your model you can get an idea of the confidence level. Mm. Yeah. Um, so it, <laughs> in in certain you know if if you say well we're going to accept if the algorithm is ninety nine percent confident mm. then we're just going to proceed to yeah. Uh, you know give give the chemo yeah uh, but then maybe if it's 90 percent confident then we're going to do an extra test yeah yeah um so so what do you think about uh uh i think it all it all, it all, it all depends on what you're using your AI algorithm for and it'll depend on the, the the discussion between the patient and the oncologist but you know so for, for, for me personally you know uh, if it's uh, a case of uh, the uh, let's say that you know it's ninety percent with uh, confidence intervals of ninety five to eighty five, right? Uh, then still, for me, you know, uh, the, the upper limit of confidence is ninety five percent. Still, one in twenty chance it's got it wrong, and you're you know you're you're, you're going to make your decision on getting a horrible chemotherapy uh, on the possibility that it might just be wrong. So I, I would say no, do do the genetic analysis. And so it may be that, you know, that uh, I think going forward that that, that, that uh, unless it's shown to be completely non-inferior to molecular analysis, then, you know, AI is always going to be secondary for that particular thing, right? It may be, you know, it may have uh, issue, it may have benefits in some kind of developing new diagnostic categories, uh, you know, some kind of prognostic features and what have you. And again, you know, I mean, if you can discriminate uh, prognosis, let, let's say, you know, so in stage two colorectal cancers, uh, if you can discriminate good versus bad outcomes, right, uh, just based on that, then, you know, that's what we do at the moment. We use vascular invasion, for example, to make a decision to give chemotherapy or not. Vascular invasion, you know, it, it, it depends on what day of the week it is, you know, and things. And so if you can get anything more confident than that, you can then still use it. Uh, but so when it comes to, you know, like targeted therapies, I think you know, it may or may not be. It depends on how good they get. So, so, uh, so the the line that I was sort of going down is more self-reported confidence. Mm -hmm. So, in a particular instance, if it, if the if the model says it's certain that right. it's that, that that's correct, yeah, 
because it's it matches the features yeah. exactly and this also comes down to the sort of explainability a little bit i think in yeah. that if it says it's identified every single feature so it's absolutely certain yeah compared to you know it's it's not quite fitting the model correctly yeah. what what do you think about that idea well uh so so you 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 you're talking about sort of kind of actually sort of signing out a report uh where you're only 90% confident that it may be right well no no what I, what I'm saying is that the the, the computer the, the the model is self reporting its level of of yeah. confidence in a particular whatever it's yeah. reporting so diagnosis molecular classification mm, right okay it, it, again I, I think it, it would depend on you know so what specific feature you're looking at so is something if it's something which is going to impact uh, uh therapy then I, I would go for the best possible thing but if it's something which is not going to be so kind of quite simple like like, uh, like say if it's kind of prognosis uh, just kind of general outcome then you know there's so much variation in what we do anyway that anything is going to be improvement so i'll be happy with that uh, but it, it all depends on what the gold standard is at the time it's got to be non-inferior to what you're doing now for it to be applicable i think so it'd be different for sort of kind of different uh, questions i mean the, the the other great thing about sort of the uh the 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 ai analysis is that you know uh it, whereas if you're doing molecular analysis you have to do extra tests uh whereas with the uh, image analysis you know you, you you've got your sections uh, the images are being scanned once they've been scanned the analysis can begin and so by the time you get to you know so sort of the slides coming to you for reporting there's already the analysis uh, so some image analysis has already been done so you're already getting information there already and then that just kind of adds to what you have and so that that will that will improve the diagnostic workflow anyway so if it kind of comes uh, you know uh, with uh, information saying that you know the 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 the, the five year outcome is in you know, so sort of 20% in this case then when you do your report so you can sort of make your uh, you know, sort of diagnostic features talk about vascular invasion and then you can also add the kind of prognostic features at the end of it so the reporting you know, so, uh, will hopefully become a lot more sophisticated as we go forward uh, but that's done at the same time as you know, as you get your routine reports Okay, any other question? Maybe we, we have time for one question. Pahmat, you have a question? <laughs> okay, please. Uh, sorry, I, I came in late. Oh, uh, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, just a, a quick comment, I guess, not, not really a question because I think the bottom leg is still about image capture yeah right uh, that's actually the, the main one but that is under a condition that you have actually a very good pre-analytical workup yeah because uh, if you have a very good scanner but then the staining is horrible or the fixation is very bad yeah so it's going to be also an, an issue yeah so i guess the probably the biggest research question right now is we, can we identify what would be a good start um and with the biggest impact something that's easily done the pre-analytical step is easy to control, mm. but the diagnosis is need very fast. If you mm. can identify those kind of issues in, in pathology, that would actually create the biggest impact. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, a bit, very difficult cancer is for probably rare, very beautiful picture, but then <laughs> the, uh, the, the pre-analytical is also very difficult. I mm. think, uh, I'm not sure the answer myself, but... Uh, something to, to think about yeah i mean uh, get, get, getting the pre-analytical steps uh right is is a real problem you know so even within the uk within the nhs i was saying you know so every single department that has a different approach to these things and if you say that you know it's kind of uh the 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 the, the, the length of fixation is a possible confounder to the ultimate image analysis. Then you know uh, things like you know if a specimen comes in at the weekend, where it's going to be fixative over the whole of the weekend for forty-eight hours, compared to if it comes in midweek, where it's fixative only for twenty-four hours, the, the, that that variation in fixation may affect you know so the way that uh, the you know it will affect the cross-linking of the molecules. Then it may affect the way that the algorithm.
And, and even if you do that, there's still going to be variation. You know? it, it is a problem. So th this is why you know, so you, you need huge amounts of data to be able to uh, deal with all of these uh, different sources of variation. But I really see that as, as a big problem for the AI. Uh, and so, you know, so all, all the publications that we see, and they're beautiful publications, you know, saying, look, look, we can extract, you know, so all these molecular signatures just from the h &E, but they're, they're using curated data on publicly available data sets. Once you get into the NHS proper, you know, is your, your, your beautiful data are gone. <laughs> so it's, it's, yeah, it's a big challenge. Thank you. Okay, very interesting discussion, but unfortunately, uh, our discussion is limited by time. So we need to close this uh, session. Uh, we will have photo session uh, from the delegation from the University of Nottingham and with all the participants. But we, before we do the photo session, please join me to give uh, applause to Professor Muhammad Ilyas. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, we have some souvenir, just a small souvenir from oh. ERC Artificial Intelligence, please. Maybe first uh, for the speaker. Okay, for, for, for our speaker first, maybe Bu Kusri can give this souvenir. This is a Tumblr with AIRC. Actually, we have for all delegation, so we have four. So uh, we want to invite you to come forward to make photo session with all the lecturer. Di di bukain aja. Bu Yulia, Pak Ahmad, mungkin bisa sambil foto. Uh, mungkin yang yang duduk paling belakang bisa ngisi yang kosong di sini. Yang baris belakang isi kosong di sini. Oh iya. Oh, 
Ya, pantas sekali lagi.